Okay. Welcome. Let's wait for one or two minutes before we get started. It has been a very busy week. So hopefully you've got some uh, spare time to relax a little bit. And we are officially in the middle of the semester. So let's wait for probably one, one more minute before we get started. So great to see many of you, all of you here. And we are very much in different time zones. I know several of you are not in the States. Uh, so great to see everyone, uh, regardless of the time zone that you reside. A lot of exciting issues are going on uh, recently in the world of AI. Uh, someone you know, may, may have heard that OpenAI uh, probably is going to decide to make its own chips uh, because the NVIDIA and AMD chips are in hot pursuit. The price is jumping to the roof and there is a significant shortage in you no know, AI chip supply, uh, and the uh, uh, the the Microsoft and OpenAI and possibly other companies will join the competition to make their own chips. Uh, Google have already made their own AI chips, uh, uh, and it uh, but well it, it only used in its own cloud computing uh, i don't think it's, it's open for sale to other companies but that may create a new trend of uh, of a new competition you no know, making ai chips uh, just for uh, machine deep learning computation which is very different than the, the cpu uh, because cpu is not optimized for Parallel, compu uh, parallel computation. So that's very exciting. Uh, and in the natural language processing world, there are new models uh, coming out. Um, so if you check the, uh, the, the, the leaderboard uh, in Hugging Face, you will see a lot of new models um, that are becoming quite competitive. Uh, Still, of course, leading the board is the GPT-4 model, which uh, have, has a competitive advantage, uh, but many other uh, big language models are catching up. And uh, some of you might have used uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the recent DALI-3, uh, which you can access through the OpenAI portal. Uh, so I don't know whether if you use the free version, you can access or, or not, uh, but if you're using uh, the ChatGPT Plus, you should have access to DALI-3 that you can write prompt and uh, the generated uh, images are, are, are quite astonishing, I would say. Uh, so uh, it's probably the state of the art now, uh, maybe beating the state diffusion XL model by a margin. Uh okay, so that's I think that's let's get started. I know we have a, a, a few newcomer uh who just joined us. So uh maybe we should do another round of you no know, brief self-introduction uh so that we will get to know each other if you if it is convenient for you, you no know, you uh you you may open your camera so we, we can match your uh your your name with your face. Uh especially for uh, people who just joined us. Uh, so we, we can uh, we can match match you with, with your face. Uh, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, if it's not convenient, don't worry. Uh, you, you will not be kicked out because you don't open your camera. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. 
So let's, let's do a quick round of uh, self-introduction, just your name, uh, your, your, your program, uh, and anything you want to tell uh, to, uh, to, 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 to the audience, uh, to other members. Uh, okay, so maybe you do want to uh, get started. Yeah, hello everyone. I'm Yu Yi Yang. Uh, you probably know me because I sent you email. Um, I'm a first year um, computational and data science PAT student. Nice to meet you all. Great. Uh, and Chen? Yeah. Hi all. My name is Chen. I'm currently the third year MSWNM PhD student, and today I will be the presenter. That's right. Yeah, we are expecting, uh, anticipating your, your talk. And uh, Pei Qi? Um, um, and currently, there has been a student in the Philippi System Management and Company of Management. Um, we have a project um, for the FAM and we enjoyed that. And it's really excited for today's topic about labeling and it is really useful for us. So thank you so much. Great, great. Uh, and Zhen? Hello, uh, my name is Zhen and I'm a second year MSW student. And this is the first time I've been here and I'm looking forward to the, um, um, hear like the insights about AI from you guys. Nice to meet you all. Yeah, fantastic to have Zen here. Uh, Zen is not new to the Brown School for sure. Uh, he has been in the in the social work program, uh, and he uh, he took my biostatistics class, and he developed interest in you know, AI applications. So great to have you, uh, and Jin. Hi everyone. Um, nice to see you. Um, my name is Jin. This is my uh, second year here, but I, actually I am a first year student of the MSW program, and I my uh, research interest is the in AI application in mental health, and I have do my internship in Professor N's uh lab for the last for the last summer, and actually I have uh made a very small program and I name it as Alan, which is my, my son's name. Uh, in the, this AI program, especially very, very uh, baby step, but I started to use it to, uh, to my intervention in mental health. And uh, its idea is uh, we write a program based the OpenAI API and we uh, design it as a therapist and to, to uh, cope with, with the symptoms of social anxiety disorder. It, it's very interesting and I'm looking forward to maybe someday uh, I can share it with you guys. That's fantastic. That's that's truly really <laughs> fantastic. Uh, and you and Zun, you definitely should connect to each other because Zun is also interested in using uh, large language models to uh, to apply to mental health problems. So you two have probably have a lot in common to to talk about. Yeah, okay. fantastic. Yeah, uh, and Meng Meng. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Meng Meng Ji. I'm currently a postdoc working at Washington School of Medicine. My research is in obesity and obesity-related cancer. Okay. Yeah, great. I work with Dr. Ann. <laughs> I was <laughs> his PhD student when he was the professor in UI. And yeah. Right. Momo is the, yeah, it has been with me forever, right? Uh, <laughs> so great, great to have you. Uh, and, and she? Hello everyone, my name is Shi Wang. Uh, I'm second year MPH student in generalist track. Um, I'm also interested in mental health and uh, public health policy. Um, so nice to meet you all. Fantastic, and, and Shen Shen? Hi everyone, uh, I'm Shen Shen. Uh, I'm fourth year PhD student from uh, UNT Health Science Center. 
And uh, currently, I'm doing some research on uh, sleep health, mental health, and uh... <laughs> oh my God, sorry. Um, nice to nice to meet you all. Right. So Shanshan is lining up for uh the talk in two weeks. So we are all anticipating your talk. Right. Fantastic. Right. That's, <laughs> that's what I want to say. I forgot that. <laughs> no, no worries. Okay. And, and Jing. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Jing Shen, a teacher from China University of Geosciences, Beijing. My research area focuses on environmental and the health or physical activity. Nice to meet you all. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah, Jing has been, uh, uh, was my wisdom scholar uh, when I was in UFI, and she has been publishing with me for years, right? I, I can't even count how many papers they published together. Great. Uh, and Isu? Uh, thank you. Yeah, hi, everyone. My name is Isu, and I'm a second year MSP student. And my research interest is focused on the using the chat GPT for mental health consultation and also the uh, the using the AI models in the medical referral system, and also how the government support the uh, AI application in healthcare. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. No, three of you actually should talk to each other, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you, so, so and uh, and uh, uh, and and Jin. So fantastic. Yeah, uh, and Xiaoxin. Hello everyone, I'm Xiaoxin Wang, uh, currently in the final year of my doctoral study in China, and now I'm a, a visiting scholar of Dr. An. Nice to meet you all. Great, uh, and fun. Hi everybody, my name is Fan Yang. Uh, I am an assistant professor of uh, in China, and right now I'm working with Dr. An as his visiting scholar. Uh, my research interest is trying to apply AI in social work. I mainly look at like uh, health related problems and health promotion. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Fantastic. Uh, and uh, Bin Yuan. Uh, Bian, we couldn't hear you. Okay, I, I think it's working now. Great, uh, great, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm Bing Yuan, uh, I'm a second year MPH student, uh, AP and Bio. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I've been here for like, like for less than half a year, at least a few months. Uh, I'm really interested in AI application in public health, though I'm currently struggling with uh, deep learning, but I believe I can figure it out. Uh, so hopefully I can there is some for you guys. That's right. Yeah, no, some of you have taken or are taking my deep learning course is definitely a little bit challenging and uh, fast paced. But no, hang on there. No, you you'll be fine. <laughs> Great. And, and Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy, we couldn't hear you. Oh, can, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, sorry, I could not turn on my camera for some reason. No but, worries. Um, uh, I'm Jeremy. Um, I'm a senior undergrad majoring in math and CS, and I'm planning to um, study AI in, in grad school. So that's why I joined this group. Um, yep, thanks. Fant fantastic. Yeah, no, definitely think about the applications, right? Besides, yep. you know, developing new algorithm, really, uh, we are really key in you know, applying AI to some real world problems. Yep. Fantastic. Uh, and then Pao. Uh, Pao, can you hear us? Uh, so uh, maybe uh, uh, Jia He. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jia He. I'm studying data science. Um, at the University of Melbourne, I'm doing my first year of my master. I joined Professor N's AI application in health program this year. Um, nice to meet you all. Fantastic. Yeah. So great to have you. Thanks. Uh, and uh, Charles? 
Hi everyone. Uh, hi, hi everyone. My name is Charles. I'm a second year DCDS PhD student. Um, nice to meet everyone and learn from everyone. Yeah. Yeah. So Charles, are you are you still in uh, in school? In yes, the office? Yes, I am. Yeah, I am. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. <laughs> that, that's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. Don't work too hard. Uh, was in office. After we had dinner, he was said, "Oh, I'll go back to office. It's already <laughs> six or seven o'clock." <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. That's uh well, this uh good work at altitude attitude, but uh yeah, don't work too hard. Okay. Uh and uh, yeah, Paul, you, you can hear us. Yeah. Sorry, I was um driving. I know. Uh, oh, okay. Hello, everyone. Be careful. Yeah, I will. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Paul Liu. Um, Chinese name is uh, Liu Peng, but you can call me Paul. I'm a first year student at WashU studying uh, MISM Information System Management under McKelvey, and uh, I'm very excited about uh learning about AI. It's very um, new for me, so I'm very excited. Fantastic. Yeah, we are really delighted to have you. But drive safe, definitely. <laughs> okay, and uh, who else? Uh, Zi Yun. Hi, everyone. I'm Zi Yun. I'm now in my first year in public health, uh, and my concentration is IPBio. I have great interest in, AP in AI application in health uh, field. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, great to have you. Fantastic. And uh, Yunghu? Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Yunghu Zhang, and I'm second year public, uh, public health student and doing APN Bio. And I also, I'm also taking the deep learning class with Professor Andy Sandstrom, which is really hard, I think. <laughs> yeah, but I'm working hard. Fantastic. Yeah, that, that's all we need, right? Working yeah. hard. <laughs> okay, but still, no, hopefully find some time to relax. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a lifelong journey of learning. Uh, we don't want to burn ourselves. Uh, you know, we want to take little baby steps. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Uh, so uh, uh, have I missed anyone? Uh, anyone who have who has not... Uh, uh, who has not, not talked, please uh, not just uh, unmute yourself and, and talk. Okay, hopefully we covered everyone. Uh, okay, so uh, without further ado, uh, that's Yi Chen to be on the floor and talk about something that my you know, myself is very interested. I hope many of, of you will be fascinated uh, by today's talk. Yeah, Chen, it's all yours. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ann. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. So is that okay? Everyone can see my screen? Okay, great. So today I'm gonna talk about auto-labeling. That is quite interesting. So um, we have like a general problem about labeling data in machine learning and deep learning um, field. And the reason is that the um, the cost of the labeling is too much, especially it is a time consuming process. And for some specific field, or like we can see like in a general field, it is very expensive because we need to hire laborers to do all the labeling work. So that is the current problem we have. And now there is a solution to manage this problem that is auto labeling. So it is basically very simple uh, that we are using the trained algorithm label each and every sample of the data automatically instead of we uh, label them manually. And sometimes uh, the trained model is to using reinforcement learning with human feedback or reinforce, uh, that is uh, RLHF. Um, so the process of the auto-labeling is uh, we need to collect a large amount of data and then dividing the data into training and testing subsets and then train a machine learning model on the train set using the manual labeling. 
and then use the trained model to automatically label the test set. And the last step is to validate the accuracy of the auto-labeled data using a subset for manual verification. And for the first two steps, um, like there are a lot of existing models that we can um, take advantage of. For example, the chat, uh, the GPT-4 and the grounded SAM, uh, the AudioVIT and DATX. Uh, these are, uh, we can see like general model that has already been trained by uh, those big companies. So we are like taking advantage of them and we ask those models to label our data and after they labeled uh, they labeled our data and we can feed the data again to our more small model and make it more accurate and then we can continue um the 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 task we ask the model to do so any questions Yeah, the, how how to make sure that the like GPT four or other model they label data is the ground truth. Yeah, this is a good question. So, um, we first use those uh the base model, those uh trained models, and ask them to label our data, and then we have some. Uh, we have our own data set and we need to test them whether um, they are performed good or not. And it is if it is performed good, then we can use this model to do the continual work. If it is not, we need to retrain them. Okay, I see. Any more questions? I know it is a little bit complex. Okay, no, I will move forward. So um, why we are using auto labeling? Uh, because it is faster and efficient. Uh, according to the um, Refuel AI company, one of the reports said that um, their model can be 20, 20 times faster and uh, nearly six times cheaper than the human labor. And another uh, uh, benefit is it is accurate and consistent because you know the if a human is doing the laboring work, they may have like some errors, maybe because they are exhausted, maybe they cannot um, see the difference between the uh, the object we want to detect. And the third benefit is um, the auto labeling tools. They have the ability to handle large data sets. Maybe we have like a million of data data that need to be labeled. It is uh, how many years? I don't know. Like uh, a lot of years and a lot of human labors to do this work. But if you use the um, auto labeling tools, you can finish them in very short time. And the next uh, benefits, it is cost effective. It is much cheaper than hiring a human to do the lab labeling work. But uh, I also want to talk about there's also some challenges that using auto labeling. Because of the algorithm trained to label, uh, are the data are only good um, as the data fed into it? Uh, well, this is the main concern because the accuracy and performance of these labeling algorithms largely depends on the trained data. So if the data is not uh, accurate properly, then the algorithm may result in inaccurate labeling and false positive. And sometimes they will have incomplete labeling. And this problem will further affect the downstream tasks. 
And another challenge is the quality control and validation can be challenging with auto-labeling, particularly if uh, the labeling task is complex or the algorithm is not interpretable. It may be necessary to employ um, human expert to manually review and verify the accuracy of the auto-labeled data. So as we talked about, if a human involved in the loop, then the, the procedure will be um, still expensive and time consuming. And um, another challenge is the interpretability and transparency because these algorithms are really complex. So it is really hard to understand why they are making such a decision. So um, this can essentially raise concerns about the bias and discrimination. Yeah, so now uh, we are going to talk about some hands-on tools. Uh, so Chen, before, before you move on to that, uh, so just adding a few comments uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with, with labeling and why we want to do that. So Chen has laid out great foundations regarding the uh, the rationale why the auto-labeling tools tend to outperform uh, the manual labeling tools uh, that most of you uh, and myself have been using. Uh, so besides the cost of concern, uh, there is another element which which, uh, which probably worth some, some mentioning. So you now think about those large models, right? Large language models and uh, computer vision models, they were trained using millions and millions of images uh, and terabytes after terabytes of uh, text data, right? Uh, so the training is extensive and those models are very large, uh, usually with millions or billions of parameters, right? So those models, um, they, are likely to be embedded into a terminal device, for example, a cell phone, right? Just because the, the sheer size of those models. And it's not also economical to use GPUs uh, for making references because those models are just too big uh, to, to run, for example, in a single machine, in a single CPU. Uh, usually you need a GPU or if multiple GPUs to run those uh, huge models, right? And, and usually, uh, the terminal devices uh, do not have uh, the GPU uh, or CPU uh, to run those models. Um, even to store those models is not possible. And consider that uh, no, you, if you use the, if you build a very small model, right, a computer vision model, a language model, right, well, language model say you only have maybe up to a billion parameter or a computer vision model with only less than 1 million parameters, those models of course can run uh, with no problem in a single even CPU, right? You don't even use GPU for computation. But then you, know, you need to train those models, right? Those smaller models, smaller version of those models. And the way you train that, of course you can collect your own data, but that's going to be very time consuming. Uh, if you use the, you know, the, the, the large language model or large computer vision model to, uh, to, to, and uh, use auto labeling tools to come up with uh, a, 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 a training set and then use the training set to train those smaller versions of the models. Then those models uh, can be deployed to terminal devices with no problem, right? So even without accuracy gain, uh, no, the, the reason why people prefer to auto-labeling because it can build smaller versions of those computer vision and large language models so that they can be deployed uh, in various situations. So that is a, another rationale uh, why we want to learn those auto-labeling tools. Yeah, Chen, yeah, please uh, uh, take over. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Han, for mentioning that. Um, so now we are going to use two tools. Uh, one is called auto-label from Review AI Company, and another one is called auto-distill from RoboFlow. And the first one, we are going to use the auto-label. 
Well, auto-label is a Python library to label, clean, and enrich text data sets with any large language models of your choice. So um, we will post this tutorial after um, um, after the, our session, and you can click the links I provided to learn more about what is the auto-label. And uh, today we are going to use the civic comments data set to uh, do some labeling work. So in this data set, it contains public comments collected from news websites. Um, the text we ask is a binary classification test. So we wanna ask is the provided comments toxic or not? So I can show um, what is the data set looks like. So it looks like this. Um, for example, uh, this one, the example is when all else falls, change the subject to Hillary's email. So the label is not toxic. And for uh, the toxic label, we have one example is set the blank dump and deaf lemming. So this is toxic. So back on the um, our collab tutorial. So um, first we want to install the library and um, and we need to set up the open AI API key, uh, API key um, because we are going to use uh, open AI API and um, the GPT 3.5 turbo as our LLM, the large language model. And this one is just ask to install the um, auto label from OpenAI. And then uh, we want to um, import our API key here as our environment. So this one, uh, I think it, it, it requires you to uh, purchase the API. And um, now if you don't know uh, where is your um, open AI API key, I provided a link that you can click there and it will provide your uh, own secret API key. Yeah, uh, so what, one comment here. Uh, yeah, actually, Chen, uh, you, you did a fantastic job. You didn't really show the API because you don't want to show API to anyone else. Uh, because otherwise, otherwise, with the API, someone can actually use it and build to your account, right? So don't don't want that to happen. Uh, and, and the second, the uh, make sure that you read the OpenAI uh, uh documentation to know the pricing for using the API. Uh, because usually it's built at a thousand tokens. Um, say a thousand token, you pay uh maybe five cents or two point five cents. Um. Uh, but they add up uh, and different models uh, have different pricing information, okay? So usually the, the GPT 3.5 turbo is cheaper than the GPT-4 and GPT-4 also have a few versions that have different pricing. Uh, and no, the, 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 uh, the token, they add up very quickly actually. Uh, so for some models that I recently try out, uh, each time I pay about, 10 to $20 <laughs> to run the model. Uh, so uh, definitely you can set an upper bound, say, you no, know, I, I can only spend $100 a month, right? So you can set an upper bound so you don't accidentally, if you if you make a mistake, you, you make the model recursive, then it's going to run forever, right? Uh, if that happens, you, know, you don't want to, you, 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 you have a surprise bill of $10,000, right? So making sure that you set an upper bound uh, so that it would not, uh, it was going to automatically disconnect to the API uh, if the the upper bound is is met. Okay, 
Uh, but well, no, um, uh, I would say when you try out your model, uh, you don't need actually to, to try out with GPT-4. Uh, I think GPT-3.5 Turbo is a good choice. Uh, because I think this is the the cheaper version of you no know, compared to other GPT three point five versions. Uh, so uh, when the model when when you are very confident about the model, and then yeah, you can you can try that with more expensive versions. Yeah, please, uh, Chen, go ahead. Yeah. Um. And after we have set up uh the environment in uh in the Python, we want to download the data set. And this data set is from the hugging face. And uh, we can use this code um, here and to get the CV, civil comments data set. And now we have two different data set. One is called uh, seed CSV and the another is test CSV. The test CSV is uh, the larger data set that we are uh, going to label using uh, LLM, uh, which is the uh, GPT 3.5 turbo. And um, the C, the CSV, it is a smaller data set uh, when we are ready to have uh, human provided labels. And then we can start it to label our data. And to process the labeling, we have three steps to do. The first step is we specify a labeling configuration. And the second step is we do a dry on our data set using the LLM specified in the config by running uh, the agent.plan. And then the last step is we run the labeling with uh, this syntax agent run. So let's go to the first step. So uh, uh, before that, we want to uh, import uh, the, the modules that we are going to use. And then we, um, we need to identify the config so now uh, we have the task name. It is the toxic comment classification. And the task type is uh, the classification task. And the data set um, it is, uh, which has the label column, which is the example that we already seen and with the label. And uh, next we need to, um, mention our label, which is the OpenAI and GPT 3.5 Turbo. This is the model that we want to use. And then we need to specify the prompt that we are going to use. The get line now we provided is, does the provided comment contain toxic language? Say toxic or not toxic. And the labels contains two. Uh, the model should select whether it is toxic or it is not toxic. And now we can create an agent for labeling. Um, the data set is the, uh, we are going to use the test CSV uh, in, the, uh, in the data set. And the next step is we need to uh, do the dry on process. And this tells us how much it will cost and show an example prompt. So this is the, I think it's the money that it costs and uh, the number of examples we are feeding to this model is 2000 and the average cost is uh, very little. And the prompt, is um, we already um, specified on the above code. So it is, uh, does the provided comment contain toxic language, say toxic or not toxic? And you will return the answer with just one element, the correct label. 
Now I want to uh, I want you to label the following example. The input is integrity means that you pay your debt. Does this apply to present Trump too? So these are some of the examples that we are feeding to uh, this model. We want to try um, whether um, this model can label it correctly. And now uh, we are doing the actual label. So uh, this is the third step to use the agent run. And uh, we put our data set here. And then uh, the maxi maximum item is 100. So we can see now uh, there are 100 items fit into the model. And the accuracy now is uh, 56%. And there are zero number of failures. So uh, we can see that this accuracy is not good enough. So we want to make it more accurate. So how to make it more accurate? We want to use some uh, shots prompting to provide helpful examples. So it is just similar to um, the human labor uh, to make decisions. The LLM performs for labeling also goes up when choosing helpful example in the prompt. Um, so what uh, we are going to um, make some few shot uh, make few short examples here uh, to the model and we add uh, these four examples to, in the prompt. Um, for example, the first one, uh, it is ridiculous that these guys are being called protesters. Being armed is a threat of violence, which makes them terrorist. And after we feed these um, examples to the prompt, let's see um, what's the um, accuracy is now. So um, now the accuracy is changing to 66%. So it's already improved somehow. But we want, so, yeah. so so Chen, uh, so yeah, let's uh, let's let's uh, talk about this for a little bit more. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, you no know, zero shot learning, few shot learning versus fine tuning. Uh, uh, so here you no. Know, are the, the the reasons you know are, are the uh, the explanations for for each okay so at first when Chen uh, has her first configuration it is called zero shot learning because she hasn't provided any examples to the model basically she just asked the prompt of you no know, giving me you no know, uh, uh, assessing this uh, the uh, this comment to see whether it's toxic or not right uh without giving examples so this is called zero shot learning because we do not provide a single example for the model to learn okay and in the second case uh she provided several prompts uh, several examples to the model and she also gave out the uh the 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 ground truth right see that no uh for each example she labeled as either toxic or not toxic right so it, this is called few shot learning because we provide several examples, not no a hundred, a, a, a million, but a few, right? A several uh, examples. And here also notice that she provide both positive examples as well as negative examples, okay? which is the, the way to go. Uh, because you know, if you have two classes, you want to provide uh, examples for both classes, right? So that is the reason why she had two non-toxic examples and uh, two toxic examples. If you have three categories, so you have, have a neutral, positive or negative, then you should give probably uh, one or two each uh, examples, okay? And uh, so those for, for both zero-shot learning and few-shot learning, we actually 
do not fine tune the model. Okay, the model is still the same model without any modification. We just provide the prompts uh, so hopefully guide the model in providing the answer that we expect for, right? Uh, which different, which is different from fine tuning. In the fine tuning, we provide many examples, maybe you no know, hundreds or thousands of examples, uh, so that we are changing, we are retraining the model, uh, so that the model parameters are going to change, right? Uh, so therefore, make sure that you understand the difference between few shot. Uh, zero shot, few shot learning versus fine tuning. Yeah, Chen. Yeah, please. Uh, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yeah. After the few shot, um, uh, providing few shot examples, uh, the accuracy has been increased to sixty six percent. Uh, but we want to increase it more. Um. So um, we want to improve prompts with error analysis. Um, but first we want to um, review the mistakes, the most ex uh, mistakes uh, and, and then um, we can update the, the labeling guidelines to teach the LLM our content moderation policies. Um, so we can first to uh, import uh, the pandas and then we want to show uh, the had 10 uh, mistakes and here we can see for example uh, this one what would Jerry Pavel think about that story exactly what I thinking about is uh, this may be longer than what we can see now, but um, it is not toxic. But uh, in the LLM label result, it, it labels as toxic. So it is making um, and these are the 10 mistakes that they um, it produces. And uh, now we are want, want, wanted to be more specific. So uh, we added the prompt that uh, we want this model is that uh, you are an expert at identified toxic comments. You aim to act in a fair and balanced manner. We are comments that provide fear. Um, sorry. It's is longer than I thought you aimed. Um, so it's kind of like providing a more specific prompt to this uh, model that saying that you are a, 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 you are standing in a fair and balanced manner and you need to uh, label it more, uh, more neural. So then uh, we can see, uh, uh, we are also providing the few shots examples uh, as we already did uh, last, last experiment. And let's see how it does. So these are the exactly the same we already done um, in the previous steps. So Chen, did, did you change the, the examples based on the uh, you, you previous show a table uh, a, a a data frame with the uh with the uh, mislabeled uh cases did you use those as few shot examples or you 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 didn't uh no i didn't okay okay so maybe you could try uh so f i i i guess very likely that uh, the reason why you can rank uh the the if if you go go to the the, the data frame session yeah if you uh, if you take a look up here uh so i guess the output df is the output from the the agent that you used right so you it, it basically give you uh 
a data set back uh, with the, 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 the both the ground truth, of course, as well as the machine labeled uh, uh, labels. Uh, and in this case, uh, um, I'm guessing, no, no, you, you, yeah, you are, you are taking a look of the, uh, they are probably not the top 10, I would say, right? They are just the, 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 the incorrectly labeled uh, examples, right? Uh, because if you say top 10, it means that those are the major mistakes, the most important mistakes made. Uh, in that case, you no, know, the data set has to have a loss function value, right? So uh, because you no, know, a, a loss is larger um, if the, uh, the, 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 the probability of, uh, of predicting that label is, is lower, right? Um, so in this case, probably you just show, uh, 10 of the mislabeled, uh, cases, right? Uh, and later on, you probably could, could, uh, maybe try to provide those, uh, misclassified labels as examples to see whether the model can perform better. Uh, just a comment. No, you, I don't know for sure it, it, it does the job, but you, you may try. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so back to our third experiment, we just like providing more specific prompts to uh, the model. And then the uh, the accuracy has been increased to 73%. So we can see that there is an increasing of accuracy, which means our model is performing better and better. And for the, uh, the, the, the fourth experiments that we are going to use, so uh, we can evaluate a different LLM provided by the library out of the box. Uh, for example, we now we are using the text uh, WC003 uh, in, in our config. Um, so the only thing that we are changing here is to change the model. Uh, it is still the open AI provider and the name we has we have changed from the GPT 3.5 turbo to text the VNC003. And other than that, they are keeping the same. So now we can see uh, if there is any difference between the the previous uh, model that uh, the tools that we are going to use. So now the accuracy is um, turning to 88%, which means this LLM is performed better than uh, the, the, the previous LLM, LLM that we are using. Right, so this, uh, this is not surprising uh, because if you take a look of the price differential, can you, can, could you show that the, the price for the, the Da Vinci model? See here, the price is 10 times uh, as much as the uh, what you use for the for the GPT three point five turbo, because the GPT three point five turbo is optimized for chatting, but not really doing uh task classification, uh, whereas the DaVinci zero zero three um is optimized for task completion, of course, including uh, uh classification tasks. So, uh, well, you, you, you get what you paid for, right? Uh, so if you build a chatbot, uh, GPT 3.5 Turbo would be a, a fantastic choice. But if you really to do, for example, scientific research, uh, no, for example, labeling, then uh, the Turbo may not be a, a, a good enough choice. Yeah, um, that is uh, what we have done for the auto labeling for the text. And um, yeah, we can see that the the accuracy is 88%, which means that uh, maybe you can just use it for your own data set and see uh, how it does on your 
data set labeling task. Yeah. Um, does anyone have questions regarding to the text labeling? So uh yeah this 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 is this is great. Uh so you could think of you know, after you you try out models uh and you see that first uh, examples make a huge difference, right? You want to provide few shot learning, providing examples to guide uh, the large language models and usually it's perform a lot better. Uh, and second, the, the prompt, the general prompt itself uh, is important. Uh, you want to be very explicit what you want to do and you know, uh, and guide the model regarding the, the, uh, the, the thinking process. So both uh, play a major role. And of course, most importantly, uh, the model itself, what model you use, uh, very likely, I would say, I, I'm not 100% sure, but probably 90% sure if you use GPT-4 model, it's going to further boost um, the, the accuracy. But being said that, uh, a, 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 a classification like this is um, it's very simple for large language models, right? Uh, and if you think about building more complicated labeling, uh, for example, if you have eight, nine different um, different sentiments uh, or different uh, 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 sensation or mood for you to classify, maybe differentiating from disgust, from sad, from surprise, um, that is a lot harder, right? It's a lot harder for human being and a lot harder for machine as well. So you are going to expect uh, the accuracy to be reduced significantly. So depending on the 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 uh, the task at hand, you may get dramatically different performance. That's so yeah, Chen, do you want to answer that question? Uh, Jeremy, I posed a question. Yes. Uh... For that one, I want to uh introduce the 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 auto label uh website that if you can see that. Okay. Um so we we have like a several LLM that we can choose for the uh task uh classification um task and for like open AI there is like a, uh, several choices that you can choose. And um, it is very simple that you can just replace that we already uh, mentioned on the uh, collab that you can replace the, the open eye key. And, um, and you can also use the models from the Anthropic company that you can use uh, these two well under the auto label library. And another one is from the hanging face. So um, these are some models that you can choose. And uh, yeah, there are also some models that hosted by review um, company, that is this one, and you can set up very easy like this. And oh, there's also from uh, Google uh, PALM that there are two models that you can use. Yeah, here's a lot that you can explore. Uh, after the presentation, and uh, for for the like what models perform better, well, it, it is kind of like uh, based on the uh, you can Google that um, and to see like uh, is that good for the task classification or like uh, sentiment analysis, and for uh, the auto label library, there is also some labeling task that they already did that we can uh, learn from. This one is to do the classification task. And there's also uh, the multi-label classification task. And 
uh, entity matching task named entity recognition task. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so I, I guess Jeremy's question is about how how do you choose good examples? Uh, so here is uh, something you consider. You no, know, first, um, you no, know, I I would say choose the not obvious ones, okay? Because obvious examples are easy to human being and also easy to machines. Uh, they are very easy to catch because if there's a very key word, uh, an F word, and of course, no, it can be captured. Uh, to be toxic, right? So that is something, even if you don't provide example, the, the language model will, will catch it up very easily, right? Uh, so choose the less obvious ones, the, those that model are likely to make mistakes and human being may stumble upon, right? So those are probably uh, the margin, uh, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the examples at the margin probably are more useful than the mainstream, right? Uh, and the second, uh, you no know, thinking about examples to be representative, right? Because you no, know, you 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 want the model to be, uh, to, to be uh accurate for the majority of the cases, right? So if you have a lot of uh, cases in a particular category, and then thinking about what examples are really representative to those majority of cases, right? Um. And then third, balanced, right? Thinking about you, you need to provide probably equal number of positive and negative cases, uh, or you no, know, if you have unbalanced sample, for example, uh, you no, know, uh, ninety percent of the language are non-toxic and what uh, and ten percent are toxic, then you probably need to provide more negative examples to counterbalance the uh, the unbalanced data set, right? So those are the things you could consider. Great. Okay, so so any any other questions for Chen? Okay, yes, Chen, uh, please take over. Uh, thank you, Jeremy's great question, and thank you, Doctor, and uh, for answering that. And next, I want to introduce another uh toast that we are going to uh introduce, uh, which is called auto distil. Well. This um this tool is more powerful that uh, than the auto labeling task. Um, well, the auto distil can uh they can use the big slow foundational models to train the small faster supervised model directly. So we do not need to do like any human labeling anymore and they can uh, transform from the uh, images and run the auto distil process and then it can provide you the edge ready model for you. And for the auto distil, we are using the grounding Dino and Sam. Uh, and didactic, uh, the this ground base model, and then we want to train the uh, target model, which is more smaller and faster to run um, for our specific task. And for example, the YOLO V8 uh, object detection and YOLO V8 instance segmentation ULO V5 and uh, ULO um, NAS. And before that, uh, before we are processing the labeling and uh, ready for them to, pro uh, to, to uh, give us the target model, uh, we need to make sure that we have access to GPU. Uh, we need to set our environment on GPU. So uh, you can uh, use this prompt, uh, this code to see if you are using GPU or not, or you can uh, change it on the runtime and change the runtime type. And so so, so one, one comment there for those who are not familiar with the YOLO model. Uh, so the YOLO uh, state for you only look once. 
So it is a serious model from all the way, maybe uh, published since 2000, maybe 16 or 17, and it's been many years. And almost every year they come up with a new version. So now the most recent one is Yulu version eight. And um, it uh, is, is a computer vision model that can that relatively small and can be embedded in a lot of uh, 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 deployed to terminal devices uh, such as cell phone, etc. And it's great at uh, uh, instantaneous uh, uh, no image segmentation, uh, object detection tasks. Uh, so it can be embedded into a camera or into a, a visual recorder that can do object detection uh, or instant segmentation in real time. Uh, so it's uh, really state of the art models nowadays to do uh, to instantaneous obj object detection tasks. Yeah, go ahead, Chen. Uh, before we start, uh, we already talked that we need to access to GPU and then we need to install the auto distill package. And uh, for that, we see that we have uh, this this one called uh, Grounded Sam, which is the uh, base model that we are going to use. And our target model, the ULO V8. And uh, these codes are just um, create a home constant uh, that is it more easier for us to manage the uh, data, data sets and uh, images and our models. Next, we need to prepare uh, our image data set. Uh, so this uh, syntax is just to create a folder called images in our uh, home directory. And uh, we want to our uh, we want our data set to be ready, and we can uh, directly get the file by using uh, a we get, and then we can unzip the videos uh, using unzip. So I want to show you how it looks like. Uh, oh on our files. Maybe we are yeah, not you, you, that. Yeah, you don't have that because uh, no, uh, you've already closed the browser. Uh, okay. So the, 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 uh, the home uh, uh, folder that you provide is temporary. So when you close the application, the Google Colab is, is gone. Uh, so unless that you you mount that to a Google Drive and download the, your, your data to the Google Drive, then it's going to be permanent. Okay. Uh, but here, if, if you close the, the application, uh, the entire folder is gone. I see, okay. So uh, the zip file, it, it has eight different videos that uh, contains uh, uh, milk and uh, and the, the milk bottle and its cap on a delivery. Um, so I can show you uh, what it looks like. It seems that I have some issues, but um, the the uh, the the final result that we want to see is that we have a bonding box by each bottle, and uh, it also identify um, the the blue cap of the bottle, and we want to identify these two with a bonding box. Uh, the original one, it doesn't have the, the, the uh, box and the uh, labels. Uh, 
so it it uh, so the next step after we have uh import our data, we want to convert the videos into images. Then the model can learn from those images. Um, and by default, the code uh will save tenth frame from each video, and you can change it uh whatever you want from here. You can just change the number. And uh, we want to uh, use two of the videos um, uh, as our um, test model, uh, our test data to evaluate our model. So this step is just uh, we separate uh, the two uh, uh, this one is separate two in our test video and have six in our trained videos. Um, and now we just want to make sure that uh, everything is, uh, it, it is prepared as we expected. So now we want to see like how many image we have in our uh, data set. So uh, we have 165 images. And now we want to see what the images we have, uh, how it looks like. So uh, this one, uh, the sample size we uh, set is 16. So we want to see 16 images and uh, we want it to uh, display it as uh, four rows and four columns which has like 16 image in total. And um, then we can, this code are just like, uh, ask the model to show, uh, ask it to show uh, what images we have in our data set. So now we can see uh, it captures random um, 16 pictures. Uh, in our data set. Uh, so one, one comment here for those of you who are unfamiliar with the visual uh, uh, files, the MOV files uh, or MP4 files. Uh, so you no, know, think about the, the visual files uh, are essentially image files uh, because you no know, visuals are just a, the the uh, a block images that capture at great uh, frequency, right? So therefore, um, there's really no fundamental difference between uh, analyzing video uh, versus uh, images using computer vision models. Uh, the models are exactly the same uh, because we can always sample the 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 uh, uh, the, the video at some frequency. You no, know, for example, the stride of ten means that you no, know, uh, for every ten uh you no know, consecrate uh the um the images you no know, sample one out of that right so it, it means that that it's going to take you know, every 10 step is going to take one image out of that frequency so uh then then we will have a block of uh, images uh to build our model right uh so that that's the reason why it's called frame uh frame stride uh uh because frame stride means though each frame is an image no, for every 10 uh, consecrate frames, we will pick one image. Okay, so th that, that's it. Yeah, the next step is finally we can auto label uh, our data set. Uh, but first, we need to define the ontology. So, what is ontology? Well, this is something that can define how your base model is prompt and what your data set will describe and what is your uh, target model will predict. Um, so now we are using uh, this prompt. This is just like we already done in auto labeling, uh, auto label uh, for the task, uh, task to task. Um, we provided the prompt for it. So we want to the model to identify the milk bottle and then we 
wanted to label as bottle. And we wanted to identify blue cap and label it as cap. And then we need to initial, initiate the base model and auto label. So the base model is um, the large foundation that we uh, already talked. Uh, so um, these are really large and slow and very expensive that like uh, maybe uh, provided from those big companies. Um, so now we want to uh, import the grounded SAM. This is our base model. And, uh, and then we want uh, to set our base model to ground SAM and uh, to uh, label this, uh, uh, label our data set by the ground SAM. So um, after this syntax has done, then the uh, data set will be already um, uh, stored as the labeled data. And then we want to uh, display some sample from the data set. Um, which is already generated by our base model, the grounded sum. And uh, um, this is what they already, um, uh, the model has already uh, annotated. So you can see there is some bonding box beside the milk bottle and the syntax that we are using is uh, uh, first we, we get a list uh, of the image names from the data set. Uh, and then we set up two annotators, uh, which is the drawing mask and drawing the boxes. Um, and we put each image uh, to the model and first we need to create a list and create a for loop to, uh, uh, to let each image into our uh, loop. And uh, then we want to um, show these plots. And uh, for now, like, the auto label work has already been done, but uh, for auto this deal, we want to uh, we wanted to do more task to make it uh, make a model uh, be available for us to use, so we can train our target model, uh, which is Ulo V eight, and the target model is um, the supervised model that consumes a data set and outputs a this student model that is already uh, that is already for deployment, and uh, these are very small, fast, and ready to perform a specific task. And now we want to uh, train fifty epochs in our uh, uh, in this Ulo V eight model, so. Uh, we can see that from um, from here, it is the first epoch that we are training the model, and the uh, we can see the loss of the box is four, and after we have trained more epochs, uh the loss will be less and less. Theoretically. So when we trained for the 50s epoch, the 
uh, loss of the box is around the half of the original result we have. So this one shows that the, the model is performing better. And then we can evaluate the uh, target model, the ULO V8 we trained. So for the, uh, this is the uh, ground truth result. Uh, and in the Y axis, it is the predicted result from the model. And uh, we can see that in the cap and bottle, it, it is doing pretty good work. It is over 90% of both results. And by running this code, we can see like how it performed uh, when we are doing uh, the uh, the training. So initial, the loss is high. And then we are doing like 40, 50, it, it is like um, the loss is being lower and lower. And this is for um, the training set we provided. And here we can see the validation um, test, how it performs. Although there is some variation, but uh, overall it is performed like the, the loss is uh, going down. Um, what did the COS and DF1 means? You have checked the value, uh, VAL box loss and the right of box loss is the CLL, CLS loss and DF1 loss. I think th this is uh, uh, the, the cap and the background. Uh, okay. And now we can see the result of um, each images. We see that there is some bonding box beside the object. And there is also the, the accuracy um, that how, uh, what, what percentage that the model believe that it is a bottle or it is a cap. And here it is just like uh, 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 run the inference on the video. So uh, it is the, the one that uh, I showed you like uh, before we introduce the uh, auto disk to. Uh, so we see the video with the uh, red lines with the uh, uh, labels. Yeah, that's everything I have for today. Um, this this is fantastic. Uh, so uh, a few comments here. Uh, one is uh, I, I just posted uh, on the chat that uh, what Chen mentioned about the foundation model she used to train the YOLO is called SAM. Uh, is is a a really large uh image segmentation model produced by a uh, train by Meta. And I just took a look of the introduction. So uh, the, the model was built upon 11 million images and over a billion uh, annotations. Okay, so it's definitely some, not something that we can personally train. Uh, uh, we don't have the data and we don't have the computational power. Okay, so it costs probably millions of dollars to train such a model with is a, a, a huge team's work. Uh, probably years of years of uh, of work to do something like that. But then uh, when that model has been trained, uh, then if you want to downsize this model, 
uh, to train a a much smaller version of the model, for example, in 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 uh, in the architecture of Yolo, then uh, the the uh, the the accuracy must be very high, and also it can be the model can be deployed to many terminal devices, uh, because the SAM model is just too huge, uh, too large, uh, to to use for 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 most people. Okay. Uh, so, but one caveat is here, as Chen mentioned, she used the prompt of milk bottle. So the reason why she could use that uh, is because the, the SAM model uh, have seen and used the, 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 the milk bottle as one of the annotations, annotations, okay? But so say in some cases, we just don't have that, uh, the model, um, the the SAMS model was not trained on some of the the less obvious, less common objects. Then no, we can't really use the model. Uh, or if you use the model, the accuracy would be very low, right? Uh, and if you take a look of the SAMS model, the majority of the objects were taken from developed countries in the U.S., of course, and in European countries. Uh, but no, some of the 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 uh, less developed countries, the developing nations, were left behind because we just don't have enough data, right? Uh, a simple example would be, you no, know, if you use the model to identify a soap. Um, that is commonly sold in the U.S. market, then the accuracy is must very high, right? But the soap in, say, Philippines uh, would be very different than the soap in, in the U.S. Uh, in this case, well, if you use you no know, uh, visuals or, or image data from uh, you no know, Philippines regarding the soap, uh, the soap, and you want to uh, to train a Yolo model uh, using this automatic labeling tools, then unfortunately, I I guess it would not work or it would not work very well. Right. So uh, a caveat is that the foundation model must have seen and used that label for training its own data, and only when that is true. Um, no, you 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 could use that to auto label, but if there's something that the model have never seen, then unfortunately you can't really take the auto labeling tool, and and you have to train your own model uh, from scratch. So that that is uh, a a a a caveat here. So don't assume that you can use this for any situation. Uh, and one example is recently uh, we were. You no, know, uh, trying to to develop some tools to identify, uh, you no, know, some cooking uh, materials uh, used in uh, some African countries, and uh, it's very challenging because the, the model have never seen those cooking tools or those uh, food objects. Okay, so in that case, uh, uh, unfortunately, we can't really borrow uh, the Sam's model because even that model. Uh, may not have seen most of the the objects uh, in, in the training set. Okay, um, so making sure that you know the the limitations and, and the the application boundaries uh, of of those models. Uh, okay, so uh, hopefully this uh, has this been a really great learning opportunity. I myself found this fascinating uh, and really uh, eye-opening. Uh, so it, it opens a new, a lot of new doors and windows for us. So thank you, Chen, for taking the time to uh, to delve into, into these two fantastic tools. Okay. And Chen, uh, actually, I, I didn't really tell her because I, I, I personally don't know those tools. So Chen uh, suggests that she found those tools to be exciting and decided to, to, to introduce those two tools. Okay, so that's fantastic. And uh, uh, next, uh, in two weeks, so Shanshan is going to uh, providing us more uh, tutorials on other tools. So Shanshan, maybe later on we, we should touch base because you know, Chen also uh, already mentioned the auto-labeling tools, which are fantastic. But then, um, no, that is not a substitute to manual labeling tools. Uh, because in some cases, in a lot of cases, actually the model, the auto uh, modeling tools, uh, labeling tools may not be uh, successful, right? Uh, uh, consider the cases I've mentioned before. So therefore the manual labeling are also needed in many cases. So Shanshan, if you could look into uh, the manual or semi uh, uh, manual labeling tools uh, on both uh, tax tasks as also uh, computer vision tasks, uh, that would be fantastic. Uh, so we can touch base later on if you want 
uh, to to uh, uh, to to help you consider some of tools in in those domains. Okay, so any final thoughts, questions, or comments before we end? Yeah, for like you mentioned, the to identify the African cooking tools. We cannot like adapt the model like Sam. So the best way now is still fine tune the model exists. Is that right? That's uh yeah, that's what I think. Uh, but well, no, you, you know, you, 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 you could also probably try the 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 auto labeling tools to see whether that has a choice. Uh, my my intuition is that is probably unlikely to be successful. Uh, because the cooking tools, uh, the food objects are, are, are not commonly seen uh, even by those foundation models. Uh, so maybe a choice is to manual labeling uh, those objects and then train, uh, fine tune, not train, uh, but fine tune a ULO uh, model, object detection model. Uh, um, yeah, but no, if we find uh, actually the SAMS model is capable of doing that, then that'd be fantastic, right? It's going to save probably um, you no know, tens of thousands of dollars to to manual labeling uh, those you no know, million images. Okay, so yeah, uh, that's all for today, uh, and thank you for coming, and we will see all of us in two weeks. Bye, everyone. <laughs>